Today I'm going to talk about a few things. I'm not sure I'll have a coherent narrative and I'll, I'll struggle to keep up with the academic excellence um, uh, that we've seen over the last couple of days. Um, but what I thought I'd talk quickly about or remind people of is the some of the work that's been done on the non-extraction values of forests and parks. I'm sort of using some of those as a, a surrogate. A bit about the social licence and public expectation and opinion on forests. So there's quite a cohort of, of uh, opinion polling that we've done over the years, which is good to look at. Um, it's not necessarily always 100% accurate, but it does give a sense of where the public sits on these things. I've got a few points around the consistency um, or the scope of the announcement on native forest logging and some thoughts on the future assessment approach. So I might just launch into it. Um, so just thinking about non-extractive uh, forest values, these are well documented. Um, we've got all those things that are important. We've talked a bit about them this morning. There's various approaches to putting dollar figures to them. Um, uh, you've got those sort of cultural services. You've got the economic ones to do with tourism. Um, you've got the sort of fundamental life sustaining ecosystem services as well. Um, and we've got those sort of ethical issues about the intrinsic right to exist. Um, and I think it's an important one, particularly for traditional owners, but also uh, for everybody who inhabits Australia and Victoria, that it's part of our identity and certainly part of our lifestyle. So here's some of the studies that have been around um, in Victoria. There's the sort of tourism spend from the Parks Estate, which is about 4 million hectares. Um, that's about 2.1 billion, 20,000 jobs. Um, the health benefits, and there's a few studies there, the valuing parks, but also a couple of others that put a dollar value on uh, avoided health costs related to that interaction with nature. The literature on those sort of health, and particularly mental health uh, uh, aspects of um, being out in nature are getting well done. We've heard about the water issues, flood protection, of course, and there's a whole lot of others, and I'm sure Andrew will talk about the outdoor economy um, and the, the dollars that are associated with that. The next part, I think, which I'll spend a little bit of time on and flick through some of the results. Um, so over the years, we've done quite a, consist a lot of polling, uh, probably every year or so. Um, we do tracking polls. Um, so this one, sort of based on probably three of the more recent ones, uh, Metro uh, 2020, National Poll in 2022, and a statewide poll from November last year. And there's a couple of key, me uh, a few key messages out of this work, and I'll highlight some of it. There's very low public support uh, for continued native forest logging, and that's been consistent for some years. There's high support and recognition for protected areas and national parks for conservation. There's very high support for forests to protect wildlife for trees and nature and for recreation. There's lower appreciation in the community uh, for other uses for forests, like carbon tourism or even job creation. When you test it, doesn't mean it's necessarily right, but that's the view in the community. Um, and there's a little bit of stuff around what helps people um, uh, engage or what attracts people to nature. So this was a poll from November last year. It's fairly consistent, jumps around a few percent if you, if you include Metro um, or just do it in Metro. But it's actually higher level um, at a national level when we did the national pie by a few percentage. But there's a widespread sort of universal uh, 80, high 80% 80 support for having a comprehensive network of national parks and reserves across land and sea. When you get down to the specifics, like things like proposals like a Great Forest National Park, uh, or Wombat Forest, or Strathbogie Forests, um, you also get a fairly consistent um, high figure. Um, we've had a tracking question around what people believe the best use for, Vic for, for Victorian forests are um, uh, for some years, um, with a few variations, um, and it's fairly consistent. Um, that sort of high 60s or early 70s, um, that the number one thing that they're interested in, in is the protection of wildlife, trees and nature. Um, support for native forest logging is always fairly low. 
Uh, in the November poll, and there's a bit of detail on how it's done, um, it was 11%, but the metro poll I did during COVID was lower again at 2% in the metro area. Um, but yeah, it tends to track around 11 to 15% and various other things. So digging a bit more into these to see some of the background, this is sort of what the questions look like. Um, you can see uh, this is from the national poll. Um, you see that the community's got a fair interest and recognition of the importance of forests. Um, I'm using parks and conservation reserves as a bit of surrogate for that, for this conversation. Uh, but it's wildlife for its intrinsic values. Um, uh, water catchments has got a fair recognition. Um, some of the economic drivers are less less well recognised um, in some of those. The other ones, when you start to dig in um, to these questions about, well, what is it that's valued when you go to these places? Um, walking tracks and trails, of course, short walks, um, interesting natural features and views, and all that sort of infrastructure stuff. The travel is important. Um, and I think there is an appreciation of having the information and the interpretation uh, done in a good way. And these are fairly consistent, um, again, at a national level and at a state level. They jump around a few percentage, depending if you're doing metro, regional or um, national. Um, and they've been consistent pretty over the last five years or so. So I think the message out of that that I'm keen to send is that there is this expectation in the community uh, that we're going to use our forests and protect them um, and we're going to use them uh, for... And there's a, a, an appetite, I suppose, for those recreational uses. Um, this is sort of also consistent with the messages that came out of this exercise, which was done as part of the RFA renewal process um, uh, future of our forest consultation on Engage Victoria. There was 2,800 responses and the three sort of planks and they had various graphs and stuff, but number one, forests are valued for their biodiversity and contribution to climate and human health. Uh, a strong recognition of uh, um, traditional owners and then the use of forests to mitigate against climate change. Um, and the recreational piece. And I think that's what the community expects in lots of ways. And so I think one of the challenges in this conversation about the future of our forests, there needs to be uh, some recognition of what the aspirations of the broader community are. So that's that bit. I'm going to talk now a little bit about some of the scope. And there's some questions and issues, I suppose, in this, just to keep them on the table. Um, the key thing. Um, looking closely at the Vic government's media release and announcement around the end of native forest logging, um, is a couple of things I'll pick up on. One is the, um, the specific use of the timber allocation order uh, language. And I'll also talk a little bit, have some ideas about the potential for what sort of panel or something we might uh, end up with. And a couple of questions about where the transition happens. The key thing about the allocation order, um, if you look at the Victoria, so this maps the parks um, plus the state forest, the purple uh, is the allocation order. Um, uh, the one thing that wasn't mentioned in that announcement was uh, what happens in the west of the state. And it's the, the what, what's, what's authorised for forestry under the uh, Forest Act uh, through forest produce licences. Uh, often called community forestry, and there, uh, the red bits out here. Um, uh, and you can see it a bit better on this one. So these areas here are on the timber utilisation plan, so um, they're uh, quite a significant area across the west of the state, a little bit in the east, so we're talking about 62,000 hectares already on the schedule for the coops. Um, there wasn't an announcement relating to this, though there was some clarification following estimates, and it seems to be the case that um, those licences may be phased out, but it's still a little bit unclear. 
Um, and so the issue with the Western stuff, well, obviously it's not at the same scale um, uh, at 1.8 million hectares, so I'm not undermining that. Um, it is in some of the most fragmented parts of the state. Um, the areas that are proposed for logging coops have increased by 50% since 2017. Um, a lot of the timber is low value. Um, programs largely uh, supported by state government grant currently. Logging methods vary from clear fell at Mount Coal to storm salvage or selective logging in some other parts. Um, and analysis we did in 2017 found a really high level of threatened species um, in these areas. It was a desktop study, so I think if you were in the field, you'd find more. Um, there's a higher number of federally listed species in this area um, than in the east. Um, different sort of picture when you start to apply the state lists. So I suppose that the key thing here and the message is that we're keen to see uh, the western part consistent with the eastern part and we don't want to see the Forest Act and forest produce licences used as some sort of loophole um, to continue forestry oops, continued forestry um, in the west or apparently and it could be possibly used in the east. So the other question which hasn't had any clarification is the status of native forest logging on private land. So while you think most of it's been traditionally on public land and um, when, it, when you look at how much of harvestable forest is on private land, you tend to think there's not much because largely the intact areas are public land, but there's more than you can think than you think. Um, so it's unclear how the native forest uh, logging on private land will be treated in this announcement. Um, in our view, of course, it should be consistent along with the Western Forest uh, issue as well. So, so far, uh, in correspondence with various ministers, they flagged that the licences may end by 2024, uh, June 2024, not 1st of January, um, but it's not that clear. So I suppose our message is not, not to end up with another loophole. Um, of course, there's also a big demand from conservation groups to end big forests, and there was a joint letter not long ago. Um, the other three issues which I'll touch on uh, which are a bit complicated, but I haven't got a huge amount of time, is the sort of framework for management of the alternative jobs um, and some of the areas that are already there. So I've got a whole presentation on, the, on fire operations um, and obviously it needs to happen during emergencies. Um, and so that's not really the issue, it's the fire preparation works. There's this view that you know, large numbers of forest contractors will come over to the forest uh, fire management operations through forest fire management. That's happening. Um, there's a lot of contracts in place. Um, one of the questions here is that when you look at forest fire management, though, it doesn't really have any oversight. Um, so the code of timber production doesn't apply. The RFAs don't apply. The uh, Office of the Conservation Regulator has no role. Um, some of the operations are similar to um, forestry, I suppose, uh, in terms of things like salvage logging or storm cleanups or strategic fuel breaks. Um, it's largely self-assessment, self-approval. Um, there is desktop assessments as we understand it, but they're signed off by the Chief Fire Officer and the Regional Director of DELP, so it's like marking your own homework. Um, logs are being sold, but out of national parks as well um, from these operations uh, for firewood timber. Um, the same contractors as Vic Forests. They are subject to the EPBC Act, but the feds have shown little interest in it so far. So I think getting ahead of the game, um, we need to have a think about that regulatory system and how it fits together and that we should have a consistent, transparent uh, regulatory system that looks at forest fire management um, uh, across the state. The other thing we'd like to see is delivering on the areas that are already committed to, and I think this is sort of low-hanging fruit in some ways. Um, so there's rough, roughly 200,000 hectares of, of committed to protection in various forms um, uh, in Victoria. So 
60, 70,000 hectares of the Central West uh, as proposed uh, new national parks. So that was promised in 2021 after an extensive VAC investigation. And then you've got the immediate protected areas, about 150,000 hectares there, Central Highlands, East Gippsland, maybe North and Strathbogies. So the Strathbogies report has been complete, as I suppose is Mobile North. Um, very interesting recommendation around the cultural reserve, which I think is very uh, important um, uh, reform and one that needs to be responded to and implemented. Um, but as a starting point, it uh, would be great to see um, uh, some of these areas uh, responded to. So the Central West Park's in here, Wombat, Mount Cole, Pyrenees, the IPAs, Strathbroke is up here. Um, so I suppose from our side we're getting a bit frustrated that there is already a number of announcements. Um, there's actually whole processes that have gone on, but getting the actual legislation in place, which is what creates the change in tenure, has been very slow. Um, so we'd hate to see it all bogged down in a another conversation about what the end of native forest looks like, get these ones out of the way, um, and then start to think about what these this other um, exercise is. So having a think about uh, what a future assessment process might be. Um, so I think one of the key things from our perspective, so the government said they're setting up some sort of panel and process, haven't heard in anything else much about it. Um, but I think, it, of course, it should be independent, should be evidence-based with clear timelines, um, and should be using the best available science, and I think, importantly, the biocultural knowledge, um, and there should be investment in that to ensure that the capacity is there uh, for the various uh, uh, land councils and others who need to do that work. Um, there should be some consideration of lessons from policy and practice in the past. And I think thinking about VAC's history in that, we've made a lot of mistakes uh, in the past. Um, and some things have worked and some things haven't. And so we need to pay attention to that. Um, obviously accessing existing values, threats and uses. And I think the question of forecasting future threats, impacts and uses, ideally at different scales, is a really important one. Often with the climate change information, for example, in terms of what's, what does climate change mean at a regional scale uh, or at a very local scale, doesn't exist at a particularly fine detail in Victoria. There's a few examples around some of the modelling that's been done in the Alps, um, particularly around the Alpine resorts, um, down to sort of 12 kilometre grids, but I haven't seen it um, at that finer scale for other parts of Victoria. So it'd be great to understand what the implications are at that scale for uh, a change in climate so we can perhaps start to get a bit of a uh, grasp on what that actually means. I'm not suggesting it's easy, uh, but an important task in this process of assessing the future. Of course, First Nations and traditional owners should have a central leading role. They are gonna be key to that future as well. Um, and I think public consultation at different scales. Um, I hear a lot just about the local um, and that local's most important. And I suppose from where we sit, you know, we've got 15 to 20,000 passionate people um, right across the state. They're not just passionate about their local patch of bush, they're passionate about places they visit, they camp, they uh, fish, they um, walk in. Um, and so there is a... a an interest uh, there uh, from people right across the state, not just local. So you need to match those public consultations and assessment uh, to the right scale. I think the other one for us, uh, tenure and regulation, of course. Tenure is important because it does play a really important role in setting the objectives uh, for places. Um, there's obviously opportunity for innovation, regulation also. Um, the governance question, and I think with the, uh, the discussions around treaty, the uh, increasing role of traditional owners in land management, governance models are gonna be critical um, and getting that mix and mash between tenure and governance right um, will be really important. Um, management in all its forms um, will be 
uh, really important. I think there's a bit of a tendency when we talk restoration and management, um, a bit of an obsession with trees and whether we should thin them or not. Um, I think we need to have a conversation about what is the whole management piece. We've got feral animals, deers, pigs, goats, horses, um, weeds in the thousands, um, and we need to think about it in its broadest possible uh, context. And of course, the funding question uh, will be critical. So that's me. Thank you very much.